Hey everybody, it's time to dig into another issue of Green Lantern where pressure continues to build and some very interesting new questions present themselves. So let's get into it. Green Lantern number 12 is written by Jeremy Adams with art by Zermanico, colors by Romulo Fajardo Jr., and letters by Dave Sharp. The title of this issue is Discovery. The United Planets Lanterns have raided the Resistance base and are taking Salak, 2-6, Razor, and Kyle Rayner into custody. But whatever's happening to the emotional spectrum is messing with Kyle's head. He describes the spectrum as a screwed up rainbow that he can't grab onto. And when the UP Lanterns push Kyle, he pushes back. An intense flash of white light erupts from Kyle, destroying everything that links the UP Lanterns to the emotional spectrum. Their constructs, their uniforms, their rings, all gone in an instant. Kyle's sensitivity to the chaos plaguing the emotional spectrum has escalated to become something incredibly destructive to any lantern in range, which could mean that Kyle is an extremely effective weapon against the army of UP lanterns. Hell, maybe it even means that he's close to becoming a white lantern again. But honestly, nothing about this seems like it's a good thing. What we just saw Kyle do feels like the tremors that come before a volcano erupts. On a lighter note, I love the fact that one of these lanterns is a fish who uses a construct body to walk around on land. There are some pretty good and fun character designs in the UP lanterns, I'd put this one right up there with Rhino Guy. Meanwhile, things are going very poorly for Hal, Joe, and Simon. They walked right into Theros' trap, and now the three of them are scrambling to fight their way past a small army of UP lanterns and ring hunters who can deactivate power rings with a single touch. I have to say, I think this would be going a lot better if the three of them were thinking bigger. Maybe it's because this fight is against a massive group in a confined space, but the Earth Lanterns are treating this like a brawl, and it's getting them nowhere. They're fighting on the enemy's terms instead of exploiting the enemy's clear weakness. The United Planets does not know how to properly train Lanterns, so all three of our heroes here have a massive advantage in the form of creativity and experience. Hal made a normal sized wrecking ball and used it to hit one guy. Why not a giant wrecking ball that sweeps the room? Simon makes two normal sized handguns. Why not make 50 handguns firing in every direction at once? Or maybe a weapon that's bigger and better than a handgun? So it's really no surprise when both Simon and Joe go down and Hal has to make a run for it before they get him too. Theros mentions that they already found the Resistance base, so Hal really only has one option left. He's gotta go back to Earth, round up some help, and then come back in force. But before he can even leave the atmosphere, he's intercepted by the Unseeing, and hey, you know what? I didn't notice it until just now, but the Unseeing are dressed exactly like the version of Kyle Rayner we first saw in the Dark Crisis Green Lantern one-shot, and the version of Kyle from another universe that Jon Stewart has been interacting with over in Green Lantern War Journal. That is a very deliberate choice, and I'm not sure what to make of it yet. Hal gets restrained, and a big group of UP Lanterns take turns hitting him in the head as hard as they can. Just before he passes out, Hal sees the sky filled with violet light as Carol Ferris, the Star Sapphire, arrives to save him. We talked last time about how, after what Theros did on the planet Zamoran, Carol may possess the last Star Sapphire ring in the universe, and that seems to have been confirmed by the Unseeing. If that's true, then Carol just became the Kyle Rayner of the Star Sapphires, the torchbearer who keeps the light burning. But right now, that doesn't matter to Carol. All she cares about is saving Hal, and she is going nuts on these UP Lanterns. She's hitting them with cars, punching them in the face so hard their constructs shatter. <laughs> She's the best. If Carol had been in that brawl earlier, it would have gone very differently. Once Carol notices that Hal is in bad shape, she disengages from the fight and warps them both back to Earth. This looks like Carol is accessing transluminal space, the lantern equivalent of a hyperspace jump that we saw used a lot around the time of the Jeff Johns run of Green Lantern and the Peter J. Tomasi run of Green Lantern Corps. Back on Oa, Theros is punishing the UP Lanterns who failed to stop Hal and Carol from escaping. Theros basically tells them to fight to the death, and the last man standing gets to continue on as a lantern. But he says it in a very particular way. He says, We do not tolerate failure in our ranks. That failure should fill you with rage. 
And then the very next panel, the three lanterns are brimming with red rage power and fighting to the death. Does Theros have the ability to control the emotions of other people? He commands these three lanterns to feel rage. And I didn't think anything of it at the time, but back in issue number 10, he commanded another lantern to feel greedy. Is Theros literally compelling others to feel specific emotions? Is that how he's been able to mess with the emotional spectrum? Or is there more to it? This page draws our attention to the fact that Theros is wearing a ring. The next page puts that ring right in our faces for a few panels. The ring has a very detailed symbol, consisting of a star with a straight line below it and two wings on either side, and... <laughs> wait, what? No, shut up. Does Theros have some kind of link to the Dark Stars? <laughs> is there a connection to what's going on in Green Lantern War Journal? Or is this just what the United Planets logo has always looked like? All I know for sure is that Theros is desperate to be the only person in the universe who wields the emotional spectrum, and that it's essential for whatever he has planned. But what's even more surprising than all of that is the fact that Theros picks up the phone and calls Amanda Waller. Apparently Theros and Waller have an arrangement. Theros agreed to stay out of Waller's business and leave Sector 2814 alone as long as Waller does Theros the occasional favor. Does that mean this is the reason for the Sector being quarantined? The measures taken to seal off the border seem pretty extreme, so I hope there's another reason that we still don't know about yet. Either way, Theros wants Hal Jordan taken into custody and knows that he's most likely gone back to Earth. Waller wants that too, since having a fully powered Hal Jordan running around could mess up her plans, referring to DC's big summer event Absolute Power, which I'm sure we'll be talking more about soon. Back in the California desert, Hal finally wakes up. His ring ran out of power, and Carol brought him to his trailer to recover. Now that they finally have a moment of peace and quiet, Carol opens up to Hal about everything she's been thinking about and trying to do. That she thought she could let her head decide what her heart should want, but no matter what happened, she always arrived back at the same place. She loves him. She understands exactly the person he is. She understands all of his faults, and she doesn't want anyone else. And hey, good for her. I hope she enjoys making the exact same mistakes for the 800th time. This is frustrating, because I don't think the conclusion Carol reached is wrong in terms of the way she processed and understands her own feelings. I just think it's a shame that she didn't fall for someone who would treat her better. Also, this is what I was afraid was going to happen. Hal got exactly what he wanted without having to grow or change or become better in any way. And if that's all there is to it, then it sucks. But the story is still ongoing, and in a narrative where emotions can erupt like volcanoes, I think it would be a mistake to look at this moment as Hal and Carol crossing any sort of finish line. Anyway, this scene is interrupted by a big shark man blowing up the trailer, and I couldn't be happier about it. <laughs> it took Waller all of five minutes to have a metahuman strike team on Hal's doorstep, and apparently we're getting a tie-in to Absolute Power next issue. But before we start talking about Absolute Power, we have to finish talking about the House of Brainiac, with the third and final part of Guy's Bogus Lobo Adventure, titled Places to Be. Written by Jeremy Adams, with art by Kevin McGuire, colors by Rosemary Cheatham, and letters by Dave Sharp. Guy Gardner is trapped in one of Brainiac's bottle cities, where a population of surprisingly friendly Zarnians are forcing him to deliver packages all day. Guy can't just break the bottle and leave because everyone in the city has been implanted with a chip that automatically teleports them back into the bottles in the event of an escape. But the Zarnian guy arrested, who actually isn't Lobo, knows where they can go to steal a tool that'll remove their chips. Guy puts on a very uncomfortable disguise to try and pass for a Zarnian. They find the tool and remove their chips just in time for Brainiac to dump all the Zarnians into the sky above Metropolis at the beginning of the House of Brainiac storyline. The text blurb at the end points us to Action Comics number 1064, which is where this scene of all the Zarnians falling out of the sky over Metropolis takes place. I flipped through the whole issue just to see if Guy makes a cameo or anything, but there's no sign of him. Which feels like a waste. I'm not saying that Guy should have played a big part in the story or anything, 
But when you have this many alien invaders attacking Metropolis at once, and the streets are this chaotic, it should be easy to show Guy fighting somebody in the background of a few panels. It's true that Guy's not officially allowed to be on Earth right now, but it's not like he can help it if Brainiac scooped him up and dumped him on Metropolis. If I'm being honest, this is the weakest chapter of the three. The most interesting part isn't even related to anything that's been happening in these backups. While searching for the tool they need to remove their chips, Guy is shocked to come across a gemstone that he identifies as being called the Eye of Krona, which he describes as a mythical object that has the potential to change everything for the lanterns. I don't know what this is. I did some checking just to make sure, and it seems like this is something brand new. Calling it the Eye of Krona makes me think about things Krona has seen, which makes me think about Krona's experiment to view the birth of the universe. So is it possible this gem has something to do with Krona's classic experiment? What could it be for? Why would Guy be so happy about it? I'm very curious to see what this thing is, and I'm also very worried about its potential to become a deus ex machina that just magically makes the plot work out. And that's issue number 12. Now I want to hear what you have to say. What do you think about Carol being the last of the Star Sapphires? What's the deal with that ring Theros is wearing? What do you think the Eye of Krona is for? Tell me all about it in the comment section down below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Things are changing pretty quickly for a lot of these characters. I'm eager to see where they go, and hopefully you'll join me in exploring what the future holds for all of them. Until then, thank you for taking the time to watch. My name is Dan, we'll talk again soon.